The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Tech Gig webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we've initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of this session is the role of a computer networking expert in the corporate world. Our guest speaker today is Paul James Vive. He's a program leader at Computer Systems and Network Subject Group. So Paul initially worked as an instrumentation engineer for a gas sensor company and moved into working for a local university as an instrumentation engineer, working on developing and building educational demonstration models in the area of electronics and communications equipment. He became a lecturer in computer networks at Sheffield Hallam University over 15 years ago and led the area of undergraduate recruitment for the Department of Computing until last year when he applied for and became the program leader for Department's Computer Networks, Cybersecurity and Computer Forensic courses at both undergraduate and grad postgraduate level. So we expect this webinar to last for about an hour with 40 to 45 minutes of presentation and the remainder time for Q&A round. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them using questions tab on your GoToMeeting control panel. So without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you, Paul. Okay, thank you. Um, as you can see from the title uh, of the uh, PowerPoint, I hope you can all see this. Um, I'm going to be looking at, from, from my experience um, with graduates and with professionals who we meet on a day-to-day -day basis when we're, we're looking at the courses and so on, I'm going to be looking at what it is to be a computer networks expert. It's something that's concerned me for a long while, um, whether we uh, have the right kind of people that are going into the industry, uh, whether we have the right ideas for the people that go into the industry about the kind of things that are going to be happening there, and also, you know, to give us a good understanding of how, uh, so, so that the people who go into the industry have a good understanding of how the whole thing works. Um, one of my contentions around this, computer science is pretty big at the moment. Computer scientists, if we look at the Merriam-Webster dictionary, which is a good English dictionary for for a whole series of terms. When we look at what a computer scientist is, it's an expert in the computation or the design of computers. Now that ranges very clearly from somebody who has gone deeply into the architecture and the programming of computing, but also into the design. Um, a lot of computer scientists start off on uh, a graduate program where they learn very general things. What I've been very interested in for, um, since I've been around computers is, is very much the hardware side, the putting things together, you know, the, the connection, the communications, because that, I believe, is where the real power lies in all of our computer systems. And it's also something that's absolutely vital to get correct. So when we look at um, uh, what the definition for a network engineer is. I might as well carry it on down that path. It's to plan, implement, support computer networks. That's from whatis.com. Designs, implements, and supports local area, wide area networks. So, so what, uh, although it is a branch of computer science, um, I think we'll all agree that it's something that's a specialism in its own right. If we don't, um, if we don't look at it as a specialism in its own right, we lose ourselves. Um, and um, as, I'll, as I'll show you later on, I think really we can look upon the whole area of computer networks as something akin to the way we, we look at engineering now and that's approach. Um, so uh, the, the problem is with the definition, it's only as useful as we can see it as being. Um, it is useful in the sense that um, I uh, can actually grab a hold of something that allows us to develop it as an engineering discipline, an engineering specialism. But even in the area of uh, computer networks, there's, there's lots of specialisms that we can look at. 
So where are we today? So first of all, I want to look at the whole sphere and decide for ourselves whether it's worth getting into. Or if you're a specialist in that area, maybe you can pick up on some of these things and say to yourself, well, actually, that's what I do. And, and it takes up all of my time looking into this area. There's 3.1 billion world internet users at the moment, which is absolutely astounding to me, uh, which is, in actual fact, 43% of the world population. Uh, I've got the references for these if anybody wants them later. Um, if we look at one day's usage, there are over two exabytes of internet traffic, which is two times 10 to the power 18 bytes of data. 200 billion emails have been sent every day. There's 130 million Skype calls on at the moment. I'm not quite sure whether this counts as one of them, and so on and so on and so on. Um, that's, a, that's a vast amount of data transfers that the internet is currently coping with. And to get to that level, it really has to be um, engineered properly to be able to make it work. Um, one aspect that's massive in terms of networking is cyber defense. And I've taken four governments that are, that are directly relevant at the moment. Um, so for instance, if I look at the UK government, um, in 2010, they made a statement uh, in, in the um, midst of uh, a recession that we were going to be pumping 650 million pounds, which is a billion dollars, billion US dollars, into cyber security. Now this was primarily building up GCHQ. A lot of this has been uh, seen within the university sector as well. So what GCHQ have then done is they've come to us for graduates. They've come to other universities. They're actually uh, accrediting a whole number of cyber security courses in there as well. There's, uh, there's this enormous growing demand for computer networks experts and particularly those who are looking in the security arena. In the United States, um, what Edward Snowden showed us all, um, it was currently situated in, in Russia, is he talked about PRISM and US surveillance, uh, the kind of things that's happening over the internet at the moment, monitoring what's happening on the internet. And the United States are pumping billions of dollars into building the NSA facility in Bluffdale, Utah. And if we look at the data that can be stored there, we're not exactly sure how much it's going to be. But if we think about uh, the amount of data that a whole day's internet activity was, and I gave you some of those stats earlier on, that's possibly what we could look at, the NSA facility in Bluffdale, Utah, uh, actually storing. Um, and it may be a lot more by the time the place is finished. In China, if we look at the China situation at the moment, again, because of the knock-on effect of the disclosures that have happened recently, not only do we have the firewall, which kind of everybody knows about, um, Chinese people and outside, quite a big thing is made about it, but, but there's been revelations about the kind of networking security that's gone in, in, in the West as well. So it isn't just China that carries on with these kind of uh, setups. And you may or may not have heard about the, the Great Cannon, uh, so the firewall um, allows or stops data from being transferred from one area to another. The great cannon, meanwhile, uh, injects extra information or subtracts information from that data traffic. Now again, if you, if you look at the, uh, the number of people that are online in China, to actually facilitate that process is an enormous concern and, and obviously China itself is, is very um, is, is pumping quite a lot of money into this whole area. Uh, so that's computer networks and security. India uh, have developed a national cyber security policy. So what we can see from all of this is that not only are um, these countries taking it seriously, a lot of them are seeing it as the most important thing that they can be doing. I think we can all agree that uh, the companies themselves, uh, the countries themselves, are seeing uh, the internet as the most important thing to stay in the game with. Um, after all, we, are, we can all see the amount of commerce that's going on in the internet as well. Governments are terrified of losing internet connectivity. Um, in the past, it's happened to whole countries when they've come under cyber attack 
either from small organizations or from supposedly, allegedly other countries. Um, and companies themselves are pressurizing governments to spend money hand over fist in this area. Uh, so it isn't just the big global multinational companies that are pushing down this route. It's actually the, the companies that are seeking a global view. Um, uh, so global competition in, pushes the boundaries of our network systems. The corporate systems themselves are part of that. Um, and the network engineering side, as a branch of computer science, is diverse and it's a highly respected academic discipline. Um, we used to think of network engineers as being the people that put the cables together, the people that plug things in. They didn't know an awful lot about anything else, but they could manage to pull things together. Now we know that the network engineers are far more than that. It's a very diverse academic discipline. So what is needed in the discipline? I think we can, you know, if you, if you are networking people out there, um, so I think um, there was one or two people from Huawei and, and so on registered there. Uh, I think you'll realize that uh, the high, there's a very high level of technical understanding that's needed, and I'm going to go through some of those things in a minute. There's uh, very advanced troubleshooting skills. Um, in some ways, although it's a branch of computer science, there's an element of this which is uh, about not just computer science, but about solving the problems that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes it's people problems, sometimes it's machine problems, sometimes it's, it's other kinds of problems like operating systems and so on. Also what we're looking at in the discipline is people with people skills. Um, without those people skills, uh, you, you will work with people and what's happening in their system. It's a bit like being a doctor. To understand exactly what's going on, you need to, to understand the way that people are operating with the systems. Uh, and also management skills as well. A lot of times when you go out into the discipline, into the area, in the corporate area, uh, the management skills are paramount. Okay, so how, can we, how have we got to this thing? How have we got into this area in the first place? What has happened? Well, first of all, there's been a massive skills evolution, some would say a revolution over time. The number of auto operating systems in use today has gone up in multiples uh, over the years. So we don't just have Windows, we have variants of Windows. We don't just have Linux, we have massive number of variants of Linux. We don't just have Linux as an operating system in Unix, we have, Bind we have BSD as well. There's different variants of Unix out there. And on top of all of those, we have operating systems for the mobile world and also for, um, for other operating systems that are sitting on, um, you know, the mobile devices as well, uh, not just laptops, but iPads and so on. How many network protocols are out there? You'd hope that at least this was stable, but I'm afraid it's not. If you look on the RFCs list, which is the rest request for comments list, you'll find out that there are innumerable RFCs out there supporting the development of these protocols and also supporting um, an understanding of them. And the RFCs is a fantastic arena to be able to see how these have developed over time. And every time we have a security lapse, the number of RFCs goes up. We don't get rid of the old protocols. Sometimes the old protocols that are insecure stay out there, but the number goes up. One of the ones that was happening re recently was OpenSSL that had to be changed because there was a massive hole in OpenSSL that allowed people to get access to the data as it was transferred over the network. And how many lower layer hardware communication standards are there? Things like Ethernet. Well, there are many, many different types of Ethernet as well. These are, these are questions I don't really want to ask. I'm just throwing it out there because um, you could even specialize on one particular area in this and uh, you would quite possibly only look at this focused area and nothing else. I think in terms of corporate organizations, this does tend to be what happens. Uh, you do tend to focus on your particular area and develop things in your particular area as part of a big team, particularly in the large enterprises where there's a lot of, um, lot of focus on individual skills 
that are needed for particular drivers for the commercial operations. I mean, one of the things that I've noted over time, we do have companies coming in and talking to the students in the university, and um, last year uh, a key uh, Cisco developer came in, and I was quite surprised when they told me that a current technical key skill in demand in UK is wireless. Um, there was a, a recent problem that we had on site at Sheffield Hallam, which was around the Wi-Fi system that we have, and uh, I must admit that it took about six months to solve this problem. So, to be honest, I can see that there is a very big need for the people who fully understand the whole area of Wi-Fi in systems today. It makes a lot of sense that those key skills will be taken on board by companies, because obviously the commercial companies realize there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, cash to be made in this particular area. Okay. Um, so if we look at what I'm going to attempt to do, and uh, I dare say there will be some questions about aspects of this as well, I'd certainly encourage you to do that, is to look at where we are today. And uh, the way I operate in, my, in uh, how I see my academic discipline is to, to look at it very much at the, the sort of lower layers of the, the ISO, the OSI model. Um, and if we look at that, this is where some of the, the, the broad, the, the bandwidth speeds are being developed uh, to an enormous extent. So at the moment, we, we casually talk about 10 gigabit Ethernet of a copper UTP. Something a few years ago would have been unthinkable. Um, now, um, November uh, last year, New Orleans, there was the supercomputing conference where you'd expect this kind of thing to be to shown and developed. They uh, showed you direct access cable, which was copper cable, um, which gives us 100 gig Ethernet um, over a short length. What does that mean? It means that we can connect the devices together across the network, which again is an incredibly powerful system. They uh, claimed at the time that they were the, one of the first to develop a one and a half terabit network bandwidth. And over 135 kilometers of fiber. Um, as you'll see later on, I think um, China are definitely going down this path as well in terms of connecting Shanghai and Beijing together. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, the layers one and two, 802.11c AC. Um, again, there are devices coming out now that support this. Um, we're not, not just looking at the, the, the 2.4 gig band, but we're also looking at the 5 gig band combining the two together, which is an uh, incredibly useful thing to operate under, and it really means that uh, what we can do is we can have very, very fast wireless transmission, Wi-Fi transmission, upwards of a gigabit, and some would say anything up to several gigabits of wireless transmission. So, in a way, the layer one technologies themselves, the hardware, hasn't really changed an awful lot, but how we've used them has developed enormously. Um, there are revolutions going on all the time about better utilization of the, the, the sort of physical layer that we have. And of course, alongside that comes the, the need to develop the devices at layers one and two and layer three as well. So the devices are key. Um, we have uh, enormously powerful switch backplane technology that utilizes these things called data pipes. Um, the more data pipes, the more expensive the piece of kit that you have, but the more data pipes you have, the bigger, the wider the bandwidth of the backplane inside the devices. So really, 100 gigabit out of each of the ports, and a 24 port, 48 port switching system is not really a problem. Um, one of the drivers for uh, the market in terms of both networking and security is the military area. Uh, that's probably, presumably, because there's an enormous amount of money spent in the area, but also uh, it, it is quite obviously the area that governments want to put a lot of energy into in terms of developing their capabilities. Um, and uh, to an extent, the, this hold back on this because we're, we're driving on the commercial side, but um, 
the the idea of en and encouraging the, the kind of technology that's utterly reliable and redundant is, is a bit more of a problem. Uh, again, there's a paper, if you look for this on the internet, Backplanes Pushing Bandwidth Limits, which is uh, by J.R. Wilson, uh, March 16, 2015, on the militaryaerospace.com site. Please check these out. Um, and what else do we have in terms of devices? So we've got the Layer 2 devices. We also have Layer 3 devices, um, which are routers. Um, if, if we look just at the example, uh, I'm always a bit wary about just talking about Cisco devices, but uh, you know, as they are a major player in the system, they have to be they have to be looked at. And in fact, sometimes Cisco don't drive uh, the market so much as the smaller companies, which are pushing into those areas that Cisco don't quite go into yet. So what do we have? The 12,000 series routers from Cisco have a 40 gig per slot capacity. Um, if we look at another company, which are massive, the Huawei 12800 data center switch, which has up to 100 gigabit ports. Uh, there's Cisco devices that now have 802.11ac support. This is now. Um, so now if we have plenty of money moved, pushing into the system and we want a mesh system with, with lots of capacity, lots of performance, we can currently do that. It isn't inexpensive, but it is quite possible. Um, if we look at one of the biggest networks in the UK, which is the network supporting uh, the UK academic, um, the universities, all the universities, a lot of the colleges as well, which is the Géant GN3 project for the UK academic network, uh, and it um, has currently a, a 100 gig backbone, so we're kind of already there. There's a project at the moment called GN3, which is pushing down the lines of a 400 gig and even one terabyte backbone, well surpassing the 100 gigs detailed again in the GN3 project. Uh, what I've done is a, is a link behind there. Uh, again, if you can't get access to the link, then please uh, question me about it. I'll, I'll send you those details. Um, to support all of these in the standard network architecture that I'm talking about currently, we have uh, the kind of firewalls that you'd expect, but there's been a movement within firewalls to understand that really what people want to have security around is the applications and the data in those applications that's been delivered to them. This is where the next generation firewalls have come in. They don't just look at the packets, they don't just look at the state information that's being transferred across them, they also look at the applications. So the information stored inside the data of those applications that allows the applications to run properly. So that's what the next generation firewalls do. It kind of still assumes that the insiders are trusted to an extent, although a number of companies now talk about zones security. So Cisco's again, zone-based policy firewall is an example here, when you can, where you can partition your network into areas. So in a university like ours, you've had a staff area, you'd have a student area, both of which may not have the same kind of uh, the same kind of security policies built into them, but you can separate a network out into this. It's not you know not um, quite um, click and connect and make it work that way. It has to be planned properly, but it is entirely possible. And there's an assumption there. But really, one of the major steps that's happened over the last few years and uh, the, the demand in the university for delivering these kind of mo modules inside a university computer networks program is around virtualization. Um, and virtualization has allowed us to take cloud computing to the next level. So virtualization, uh, again, if you don't know what it is, what you're doing with virtualization is you're taking um, all of the hardware that you know and love and turning it into a software. So you're virtualizing all of the hardware inside the system. And this started off as just virtualizing the desktop and it's a lot, lot more than that at the moment. Uh, when we talk about software as a service, uh, we talk about um, networks as a service and so on. The, the acronym for that, as it says on there, is XAS, so anything as a service. And the, the area that I would touch on in terms of this and where 
companies are looking at, and again, where the expect expertise is needed for these areas, is software-defined networking. This year alone, I must have had a request for at least uh, four or five projects on uh, an understanding of software-defined networking. Uh, students themselves at the age of 19, 20, 21 um, are desperate to grab this technology and fully get to grips with it. And, and part of the technology is there's a certain amount of complexity behind it, but um, really what it does is it does away with the complexity for, um, for um, universities or for corporates, for any organization. What you have with software-defined networking is a decoupling process going on. So what happens is the network services are decoupled from the hardware. So they're decoupled from the underlying architecture. Um, and they're, they're what's called decoupled from the forwarding process. So when we want the packets to get from one part of the network to the other, what we do is we forward it across routers, we send it through switches which direct it to the right place. So what uh, what we're doing with software-defined networking is removing ourselves from the hardware complexity. Um, network services are generally about communication processes and what we can do is we can then layer on the correct kind of network services that we would need for the particular kinds of applications that we want to run across the system, which gives us a, an enormous amount of flexibility and it also is incredibly attractive for companies. They really don't care about what happens at the infrastructure layer. What they care about most is about delivering applications to customers, to each other on time. And this is why software-defined networking is so big at the moment. And one of the problems with it was having uh, uh, an understanding between the two layers, the, the control layer, as you can see on the, the slide, and the infrastructure layer. And what there is, is there's a, a standard being developed, which is largely used and very effective, which is called OpenFlow. And again, if you look at the uh, SDN white paper, uh, you can have lots of uh, information about uh, OpenFlow and how it works and so on. Um, what is interesting in this field um, is the, the old networking companies themselves have had to have been if you like, pushed down this process. Um, we, we love virtualization. Uh, inside the university, everything is virtualized. Um, and it's the same for most other companies as well. There's, there's, a, there's an enormous cost benefit uh, by virtualizing, uh, using either ESXi or using software divine networking in whatever way you like. Cisco, though, are a hardware company. Uh, representative, a lot of hardware companies uh, like Juniper, for instance, as well. Um, and what they've came up with, what they've come up with a couple of years ago, was this thing called application-centric infrastructure. Uh, what I do like about the Cisco process is it kind of modulizes everything, so it makes it a lot easier to understand how the infrastructure networking process is working. What they've then built is uh, Nexus devices, the NAT thousand series, which which are this instance, as far as I know, go up to 100 gigabit Ethernet. And um, what they've done is they've taken their hardware and integrated the software um, defined networking into the hardware. So what Cisco now sell is hardware and a fully and tightly integrated software into that hardware. And both Cisco and Juniper have gone down this path a little bit. Um, the argument around this is really isn't this contrary to the normal modus operandi. I mean, one of the reasons for developing OpenFlow and SDN was to remove the need for a dependence on the hardware. So you could control the network without uh, having that, um, without having to move things around, without having a tight understanding of how the, uh, without having a tight understanding of how the actual infrastructure works. I guess the advantage to this tight integration is that we know when we buy a box with this on, it works. Uh, the disadvantage is that you're not really removing yourself from it, but OpenFlow's issues and problems are largely to do with the multiplicity of networking hardware out there, 
to enable all of these to be integrated seamlessly together to provide you with those networking services. So there's an argument for both sides, there's an argument for both cases, and I'm sure that argument will carry on uh, for a long, long while yet. Uh, it's kind of the nature of the beast that we're dealing with here. And again, you know, if you're, if you're um, seeking to work in a company as a network engineer, these are the kind of decisions that you'll have to make. Uh, I have no doubt that, that there's a cost um, benefit in the long run to going down the integrated path, but in the short run, it is going to be a little bit more expensive to do that initially. So, again, you know, we're, we're looking at how these tools are operated with. Well, what about the management of these systems? Um, it was brought home to me uh, quite recently in terms of SMEs, uh, which are small, medium-sized enterprises. Uh, That's what, what the term is. And um, one of the best systems that you can possibly use, and a number of um, internet service providers uh, are one of the installers for, for big enterprise systems, cable com, for instance, uh, advises and uses themselves SNMP-based systems, simple network management protocol. Uh, one of those is, is Cacti, which um, manages the whole SNMP process and a, a little bit more gives you some beautiful graphs coming out of it in terms of uh, your network activity and what's going on at any time. Um, you've got a, an application on the open source uh, called SmokePing, which is uh, which deals with the very, very important but difficult to ascertain sometimes network latency across an enterprise network. And you also, you also need to know exactly which protocols are being used at any time across the whole of your network. And there are, there are programs like this as well. Um, um, uh, a student has recently written me, written for me a, a paper on this whole area of building network management into uh, small or medium-sized enterprises. And uh, if you can get away with integrating these together, and you have the right kind of skill set based in your company to be able to do this, then it is a, an incredibly powerful and very effective system that you can build. Uh, really, though. Uh, and I'm not quite sure whether we're there yet in terms of big enterprises, big corporate enterprises, we, we need the unified network management. Um, it's the goal, really. Now, you, you might say to me, well, actually, we're there with unified network management. Yeah, okay. If we use a single set of equipment from a single manufacturer, as soon as we start mixing and matching, as soon as we start going down the cost-effective route, we can come a cropper. Um, there are a number of multi-vendor, multi-network uh, report capabilities. I believe HP and SolarWinds, uh, two of those. The, the Cisco um, uh, network management tools are kind of just tend to be Cisco-centric, um, which is fine if you if you if you use those that piece of equipment, but not so good really if you are moving down uh, a multi-vendor path. Um, and again, you know, what are we looking at in here is unified network management, not just all of the piece of equipment on the system, but we've got Wi-Fi, we've got wired, we've got cloud systems that we want to relate with, we've got the security that's overlaid on top of that, and uh, software-defined networking. Um, uh, one aspect of software-defined networking, I mentioned it earlier on in terms of firewalling, you know, the classic firewall in a classic enterprise without so many cloud systems you kind of know where your secure areas are and your insecure areas are and you can create that boundary. With software-defined networking, it's a lot more difficult. Um, you have to regard each device as an individual device and uh, relate to those directly instead of um, looking at an inside and an outside to the network. And again, it's the same for the cloud. If we're happy to rely on Amazon or whoever provides you cloud services, uh, for their security, that's fine. Um, I, I know a lot of uh, companies might not be too happy with that, particularly the big enterprises. So this has to, again, be looked at very carefully and the, the kind of devices that are around to be able to manage that. And there are a number of companies, again, that provide that kind of multifaceted uh, firewalling system. It's not the be-all and end-all. Um, one of the things I haven't mentioned on here in terms of unified network management is the security side and, and really... Uh, if we want to look at the security, we've got to also look at um, um, IDS-type capabilities, intrusion detection systems, 
to enable us to monitor exactly what's going on. Okay, so what we're coming to here is a, is a kind of broad understanding that it's a massive area, massive academic area that we need to look at here. And there are, uh, even today, some giant leaps being made. Um, and one of those, I would maintain, is the Internet of Things, or um, sometimes it's called the Internet of Everything. It depends on how you look at it. I prefer to think of it as the Internet of Everything, because I think that actually is where we're going. There are many, many companies involved. You know, Apple, Cisco, Google, Oracle are a few of them. Um, uh, I was reading recently that even the United Nations is pushing for a standard, uh, because what, that, what the UN is looking at is, is uh, monitoring of um, maybe even logging in areas where it's not supposed to be done. If we had some hardware resource that's uh, attached to to trees in certain areas where we, we, we expect logging to go ahead as soon as it happens, an alarm goes off and it can highlight uh, to the monitors exactly what's going on and we can, we can see. So um, this idea of the internet of everything allows us to have a, a glimpse um, and utilize big data techniques to be able to manage all of those devices that are out there. I think this is why we're looking at, in terms of these uh, Internet of Everything, companies like Google, uh, companies like Apple even, um, who've uh, just brought out the HomeKit certified. Uh, it's not all of their kits themselves, but uh, is their own. But um, if you want to be HomeKit certified, then Apple will do that for you. It allows these devices to talk to each other. Google brought out, uh, bought out Nest. Uh, which is a home, home autom automation system, and there's a number of things that Nest have brought out recently, uh, but it allows Google themselves to be to buy into this Internet of Everything process. Okay, so um, I think I've hopefully made some kind of broad sweep that's been interesting to some of the people, that, some of you that have been listening. I do hope so. Um, what I'd now like to do is to look at the future. Uh, I think. Um, if you're a network engineer, if you're working for a large company, really the future is something that you need to be able to, to show that actually we're heading towards. Okay, we don't want to be the state of art and everything. We want to make sure it's working first. But there are glimpses of some very exciting things around the corner. Uh, so the other day with a, with a colleague from the university, we were talking about holographic computing. Um, I, use, uh, I was going to put a, a picture of iRobot up there. I'm not sure whether copyright allows me to do that. but uh, one of the things in the film that was truly stunning was to be able to replay incidents uh, that had happened from any angle, uh, which allows you to see uh, the process of the development of, let's say, a traffic incident from the beginning to the end. Now, how could that possibly come about? Well, already in cars, we have engine management systems. Already in cars, we're developing towards Wi-Fi systems that are connected through 3G or moving towards 4G. So we, we have the capability to monitor uh, the things that are happening around us. Uh, we have reverse lights and cameras, we have uh, parking, uh, lights at the uh, parking sensors at the front. So it doesn't take too much of a, a grab to imagine that all of these sensors combining together, maybe sensors on the side of them, maybe sensors under the road themselves, to be able to store this information. And the, the ability to replay a traffic incident is incredible. One of the things I mentioned at the bottom there is the Data Protection Act. The UK Data Protection Act is kind of all-consuming. It keeps being changed depending on the current government and the current updates, the kind of things that we need to do. But basically it means that your data is protected. Uh, people cannot talk about you individually. Now, um, you might say, okay, if we have the internet of everything and, and full communication standards and the um, networks are able to talk to each other and relay information back and be used in big data, surely that challenges the whole process of a Data Protection Act. Well, yeah, maybe you're right, but we kind of already do that. And it's, it's kind of gone under the barrier a little bit in terms of the information flow. Um, recently, in I think it was in Manchester in, in the UK, we had uh, rubbish bins that um, had Bluetooth on them and Wi-Fi that could grab information of anybody that walked past. Now, that, that's very uh, useful 
for the company that was providing those bins because it could then find out who was walking where and maybe send you a Bluetooth request to buy something in a local shop, whatever. But it was challenged under the Data Protection Act. It was decided that it was uh, contrary to, to um, um, individuals' uh, rights and they, they were turned off and thrown away. But uh, cars and companies are doing this all the time and pushing those boundaries uh, fairly successfully at times as well. So it's not that we have to be careful about it. I think sometimes you, you have to look at the reality of the usefulness of these things. Um, but it, again, it's, it's a debate. It's up for question. Another aspect is we have optical switching already. Is optical routing. Um, routing, that will take routing up to the next level. Routing is uh, layer three. We've managed to remove the whole routing process from a lot of our wide area networks by using a collapsed backbone, uh, by local networks by using a collapsed backbone across the enterprise because switches are by their very nature, the, the lower down the OSA model, they're a lot faster than routers. If we can improve the speed of optical routing, that takes us to another level, both for internet activity and the amount of traffic we can then transfer across the internet and for um, optimizing the whole process. So again, optical routing is one of those things that's around the corner. Um, it is kind of like an avalanche that we're looking at here. Uh, that's mentioned in uh, text, if you get a hold of it. Uh, um, the avalanche that um, uh, the futurist inside Cisco has talked about, Dave Evans, and he mentioned the avalanche of technology that's around the corner. He was talking about a, a time frame of anything up to 25 years where we looked at terabit to the home, terabit networks to the home. I dare say when we actually do that, there will be no doubt that we'll actually use that, that data. Uh, there, there seems to be no limit in the amount of data we can develop and also the amount of data we can consume. Software-defined radio, the integration, the total integration of all of the radio devices into a single device that is software controlled. Uh, do we have that already? Not really. The smartphone integrates all of lots of different pieces of hardware and those hardware is then organized so that it kind of talks to each other if you design the right applications that sit on top of it. What I'm talking about here is in the same way that software defined networking um, abstracts the network services from the hardware, we're abstracting the radio services from the hardware completely. So you have full control. That allows you in military situations, for instance, to be able to modify the, um, the, modify the radio signals according to how you want it to go ahead. Um, so if you have to have varying uh, radio signals, as long as you've got an encrypted software process that allows this to happen, it, it gives you an enormous amount of flexibility. Um, imagine integrating GPS, radio, uh, everything else into some software control device as soon as there's an upgrade for it, it's the change in the status, we move from 4G to 5G for instance, we can do that with no hardware upgrade whatsoever, it's just controlled in the software. Of course this is dependent on CPU capacity, but as we know the CPU capacity is increasing tremendously over time. Another big aspect is quantum networks. If I can just talk for a, a few more minutes, I think we started a couple of minutes late. Uh, quantum networks have been mentioned in the major news networks uh, like Time Magazine and the Telegraph. Just to, to mention, MIT researchers are on their path to developing um, interaction between um, molecules, the rubidium atom, I think it is, and a photon. So a photon changes state and the rubidium atom, rubidium atom reflects that. That allows us to, to manifest uh, a process and have a communications link between systems over time. I'm, I dare say that's a few years down the road, but if we look at quantum security at the moment in terms of encryption, that is being developed already. Uh, China is building a secure comms link between Beijing and Shanghai, which is 2,000 kilometers in length, and the security is going to be provided by quantum encryption. They're terrified of the... Um, the, um, the Snowden uh, security information that's been, that was provided about what's happening, the kind of things that are being monitored at the moment across the world. So they want to make their uh, networks impenetrable. And quantum encryption is one of those ways that appears to be able to do this. So the minute you observe, the, the microsecond, the nanosecond you observe the data, it changes the data. 
rendering the data completely useless to the observer. And this link is going to be taking advantage of that. So, what do we do? Um, it's a massive area, huge academic discipline. There are enormous specialisms around there. There's a, there's a huge amount of academic research into a number of these areas. Um, so, how do companies recruit this resource? Um, as we know, computer science has evolved as an engineering discipline. There are various aspects to this. It's many strands. It's not just programming. Um, we want our network engineers to develop. It's not just uh, along the lines of a few training courses. It's much more than that. And uh, I think um, if, if you graduate from a university, university graduates are an excellent starting point for developing this expertise. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to do then is possibly, hopefully you've enjoyed most of this. As you can see, it's a bit of a broad sweep, I admit. It's a difficult area to grab. Um, hopefully I've got across a, a few of the key ideas there. So um, if anybody wants to ask any questions, I guess, now's the time to do it. Thank you, Paul. Um, Thanks for the insightful presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, we would request you to take up the few questions that we have right now. Uh, and uh, participants, you're requested to post your questions now. Hi. I'm not quite sure what that, that means. Okay, what is zone security? Okay, so um, Cisco brought out the zone-based policy, policy firewall. So somebody's asked the question, uh, if I can just find the name. Let's have a look. Okay. Somebody's asked the question, what is zone-based policy firewall? What is zone security? If you imagine in an enterprise network, you have different areas. Uh, so it used to be uh, who has control of the color printer, for instance, a long while ago. Um, what you'd want is a uh, very expensive piece of kit. What you want is only some uh, people to uh, have control of those particular printers. It's taken very much into the next stage. So we only want parts of the network to be accessible. What we do when we modularize the zones of security in different parts of the network is we create um, areas of difficulty for hackers to break into. So, okay, they may have got into one part of the network, but they won't be able to get into another part of the network because it's zoned. So that's one reason behind it. If we look at the university that I'm in at the moment, we'd have, uh, we have a number of different uh, customers, if you like, one of which is the staff, the academic staff. We have administrators. We have uh, information security people. We have uh, administrators for the, the network. We also have the students. Each of those have a different viewpoint on the network itself. And so what we'd like to do, ideally, is to separate them out into zones. So um, a zone security is really all about creating those boundaries, which are difficult to break through. Um, as I mentioned, Cisco have done this zonal approach. A number of other companies are doing it as well. Okay. I hope that kind of gives some idea about this. Again, I can post links uh, uh, for these things as well. Uh, right. How to solve intermittent problem of network connectivity? Okay, that's a that's a very big question. Uh, uh, I guess that. Um, uh, so the question is, how do we solve intermittent problems of network connectivity? Um, I think it's primarily about the design of the system in the first place. So why do we have intermittent problems? We have intermittent problems because a device fails or a piece of software fails. And what happens is uh, there isn't a backup. There's no alternative path through the system. So the packets between you and the remote system uh, break down. Uh, if we connect to the internet, uh, that kind of intermittent problem was built into the design of the internet, internet right from the very beginning. And it was built into 
the design of the internet because it was for primarily military reasons. Uh, what happened is we wanted to have, or the UN, United States wanted a network that was robust enough to, to survive a nuclear attack. And the only way it could do that is to have a massive amount of redundancy and protocols that could cope with the process of things failing. Um, I guess when you get intermittent problems of network connectivity, what you're primarily looking at is a single machine with a single connection to the network and uh, you know it, it may well be the intermittent problem could be down to the connectivity between that machine and the network rather than the network itself. Um, we've, we've suffered big problems in the past in terms of connections onto wireless devices which I mentioned earlier on uh, in terms of Wi-Fi that actually came down to the software that was running on the wireless access points. So I guess if you look at the, the software itself uh, as a single point of failure, that was the thing that again caused the intermittent problems. So how to solve intermittent problems? Build in redundancy. Um, mesh networks are very effective at doing this. Mesh networks have their own problems because how do you firewall uh, connections, how do you provide security between uh, devices that are inter fully interconnected, and again, um, you know, these are these are problems we have to deal with and have to to look at. Um, so I'm not sure whether I've solved the problems of network connectivity for intermittent connections, but it is one. Uh, it is a key question, really, that um, you know a lot of people have problems with. Anything else out there? Yes, Paul, the questions have been assigned to you. We have one from Kishore Das. Okay. Okay. What are the best practices to set up? Um, what are the best practices to set up a wireless network in an office? Uh, Shinab Shah. Um, okay. If I look at that, what are the best practices to set up a wireless network in an office? Um, one, of the, one of the problems with Wi-Fi is uh, you can't see the signals, uh, so you are, it, it seems to be random, okay, I think I'll put a, a wireless access point there and I'll put a wireless access point there. Um, a, a good process is to get um, battery operated wireless access points, fix them in the areas where you think you might need them, which give you the best response and then walk around with a laptop and uh, use a monitoring program, either Wireshark or some other monitoring program to look at the strength of the signal. Because it's uh, entirely surprising sometimes that uh, you would imagine you'd be able to see wireless signals, but you can't. Um, uh, if, you, you, if you have an office with um, uh, some aluminium or some kind of conducting material in the plaster that you can't see, then it acts like a Faraday cage and you won't be able to get uh, and a Faraday cage is a, a, a way of um, stopping or blocking radio signals from one part of the, the company or one part of the system to another. And if you block those signals, then you won't be able to get the traffic and the Wi-Fi just won't work. So really, by far the best way to improve your signals with Wi-Fi is to have um, a, a device that allows you to, a uh, wireless access point that connects to the network, and you can test the signals from it and place them in the right right areas. Of course, uh, to those wireless devices you also need power and you need some kind of network connectivity um, uh, at some point. Uh, you can have repeaters across the system which are also very useful but they do add to the complexity and so there is wiring to those wireless devices so that also has to be thought of. You can have power and wired connectivity to a device if you use power over Ethernet, uh, and the power over Ethernet is a single CAT6 cable which connects to your uh, wireless device, and that CAT6 cable also has power going along it as well. So the device is powered by a single cable. Again, really useful if you don't, uh, if you want to plug it somewhere where there's no uh, power, which is in, uh, you know, in a lot of offices right at the top of uh, the doors and so on. Why would you put a why would you put a PowerPoint there, for instance? Uh, hopefully that, is that okay? 
Uh, what do we have? Hardware, what are the hardware software requirements for anything specific? Uh, okay, I'm quite sure what that means. Okay, if I look at um, Mr. Kumar, Sandeep Kumar's question, what is important experience of or certification? Okay. Okay, so um, in terms of certification, uh, again, we have a lot of companies coming through. What we've moved into in the, the degree that we have now, we didn't used to uh, run it alongside the Cisco certification, but uh, we were constantly uh, being told by companies that the Cisco certification is a really important part of uh, the, the degree process, and a lot of universities are doing this, so we've included it two modules in the first year, two modules in the second year, by the end of the second year you're qualified up to CCNA level. Um, as a result of this, a lot of our students are uh, finding they get a good response from employers. Uh, if we can take them up to that level. So I can only say in my own personal experience, probably in terms of infrastructure, uh, that is hardware on a network, then um, the Cisco certification is, is pretty good. Um, and it's not easy to get hold of, and um, the, the, the issue with it, uh, with any certification, is that the internet's there. If you go to, to the dark web or other parts of the web, you can find out questions from the online tests and you can find out the answers. Now, you know, that's kind of okay, so you can pass the certification. What employers will do, and they know about this as well, people aren't silly, and employers aren't silly, they'll test your practical capabilities as well. So unless you've had some practical experience with the actual kit, then it isn't going to work. Um, so I would definitely recommend certification, whether it's Microsoft certification, whether it's Cisco certification, but um, I would also layer on top of that some good practical experience. You know, uh, if you're going to go on, a, um, um, if you're going to go on one of these short, week-long courses, then I would make sure that you have access to the kit. Uh, you can actually get virtual access to the kit as well, which is okay. Um, I personally myself prefer to get hold of it um, individually. Uh, do you need a higher, somebody asked me, Sandeep again has asked me, do we need a higher degree? Uh, uh, let's just have a look, what does it say? Do we need higher degree holder or higher experience for a network engineer for uh, a corporate organization? for an organization with a good reputation. Um, I, I do know, um, I talk quite a lot with Citrix in the UK, and they're a company that, um, you know, the, the webcam that we're looking at now is based on, a very big global company, uh, as you know, um, and they have taken people on in the past with no higher degree and no certification, but you have to, have a, you have to stand out in some way. Um, one of the ways of getting introduced to the right companies, one of the ways of getting the right kind of technical knowledge behind you and the technical know-how and also the kind of uh, experience that you need in terms of um, professional skills is to do a degree. Um, if, you've already, if you already have a degree, then a master's qualification in networking is a, is a really good idea. Um, I mean, I, you know, I have my own personal uh, slant on this, which is that I think a master's qualification alongside uh, one of the Cisco certifications covers both of those angles. Um, so uh, I think, uh, again, you know, a degree is, is vital. Um, when we look at a higher degree, one of the big questions for India particularly is uh, the difference between a BSC, a BNG, sometimes in networking, and a master's qualification, or even doing a doctorate. Uh, so if you do a BSc or uh, uh, you know, and you have that kind of qualification behind you, uh, it may not be so easy to climb the corporate ladder. Um, in which case, yes, a master's qualification is really good for doing just that. It shows you have a higher level of academic qualification. Uh, we don't have that experience in the UK. Uh, an undergraduate degree is sufficient, and uh, you know, there, there is a, a small follow-on onto the master's qualifications, not large, because a lot of our students finish the degree and go straight into working in industry. 
And so we have to focus an enormous amount on the degree process itself to, to ensure that it has the right kind of practical uh, know-how, lab-based know-how, and academic uh, understanding of the, of the uh, subject area as well. So um, is our higher degree needed? Do you need lots of experience? Yes. Um, is a higher degree needed? It depends on the company. Um, I'm not sure currently whether in India uh, that are uh, that there's an absolute need for um, uh, a master's if you have a, a UK if you're a UK graduate. I don't know. Uh, I don't have the the um, the experience to be able to, to to say whether that's the case or not. I can just look at the UK and I, I know uh, from talking to people what the situation is in India. So I think you have to, to uh, talk to some companies, look at the kind of work you would want to go into in networking as a network engineer, talk to companies, talk to important people in those companies and ask them. Um, and that always prepares the ground yourself as well. Okay, so if I go away and do this, then um, I can come back to you and would you look at me more closely in terms of my skills? Um, if I just go down uh, to the next question. Okay, what are an imperative for a professional network engineer for an MNC. Uh, MNC, Microsoft Networking Certificate. Is that what we're looking at? What are imperative for a professional network engineer for MNC? Uh, if, the, if Sandeep, if you could uh, expand on what you mean by that, I'd be grateful. I'll, I'll have a look at that question again in a minute. How the SDN um, somebody's asking me, Kishore Das, how the SDN, Software Defined Network, be blended with quantum security? Uh, what could be the potential devices, services, products where we can see? Amazing, wouldn't it? Uh, absolutely amazing. Um, I've said there's a, there's a problem with software defined networking in terms of security. So what we have is we have um, a process whereby if I can go back to the slide, um, okay, right. If um, we look at that slide on software-defined networking, what we're doing is we're distancing ourselves from the hardware. We are creating uh, a mid-layer uh, controlled by OpenFlow, which allows us to control. Uh, the network services without having any regard to the hardware. And what we've got then is a, a multiple point entry into the network services. There's no real control of the approach to the network services. So the firewall then becomes a bit of a problem. Um, so what you've come up with there is, is a possible solution. Um, uh, the only, the only, quantum encryption, uh, quantum computing, uh, is a fantastic um, option to give governments the kind of power they need to encrypt the, the things they're doing. Witness uh, China doing this between Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, it's an important product. Um, we, we don't necessarily need to go down the path of quantum encryption to be able to uh, provide the kind of encryption layers that we want at the moment. AES-256 is one of those encryption processes which is very powerful and very um, and, and probably good enough at the moment um, as long as you maintain um, if you keep your keys separate and if you keep uh, changing your keys every couple of months so that nobody can um, reverse engineer uh, your key to be able to get the information they want then you're probably okay but as time moves on, as we move fully into the software develop, uh, software defined networking region, I think you're right. I think you've got a very good question there. I think uh, quantum computing, quantum encryption, quantum security would be amazing uh, if we could develop that. Um, in terms of what could, well, the further question on that, what could be the potential devices, services, products where we can see this? Um, I don't know enough about the inter-city inter link in China that I've mentioned. Um, my guess is they will be using SDN to manage the system flow between the two systems. So uh, 
uh, that fits in very nicely with the idea of the quantum encryption that they will be developing. Uh, again, I can't be definitive about that, but it is absolutely one of the things that's being developed at the moment. Um, uh, the, the, the type of products, it's up to your own imagination to, 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 to define that. Um, I, I, if you were looking at an area of research, an area of interest that would be the most useful path to go down, I think probably um, the Internet of Everything, the Internet of Things is the path. We already have a huge number of devices that we can take advantage of at the moment that allows us to interconnect these. If I use another example with this, uh, robotics um, allows us to, to build very small robots. Uh, we, we're thinking currently of sending, uh, instead of one big robot to Mars for instance, we're, sending, um, we're thinking of sending lots of little small robots and uh, treating them as a swarm. So if, if uh, one of them breaks down, then the others take over. Um, to do that, there has to be a good communication protocol between each of those robots. So it isn't just about individual bits of hardware anymore, it's about the robots communicating with each other to be able to decide where they want to go next, where they want to explore. So you send a bunch of robots up to Mars, they uh, explore the surface of Mars individually, they, you combine all the information together in the same way that I talked about holographic computing, um, holographic networks, and you end up with an enormous amount of three-dimensional data. Instead of effectively the one-dimensional data we're getting back from the, the current Mars lander. And the same thing could be applied to situations in the UK. We have of robots and we have systems currently that are networked together, micro robots that you'd send into fires uh, that can see through smoke and that can um, rescue people from these situations. So in terms of research, I think the Internet of Things would be probably the best avenue to carry out the kind of research that uh, I, I presume you, you're asking me about there. Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess I've kind of run out of questions there. So, uh, is there anything else? I think I've gone on for 10 minutes longer. Um, what do we want to do? Call it a day? Yeah, okay. thank you. I think that seems to be it. Okay, yeah. so thank you very much for taking part. Um, I think the moderator will have something to say now. And uh, hopefully... I'll see you again when we do another one of these things. Thank you, Paul. Okay, thanks thanks. For the, yeah, thank you for the insightful uh, webinar. It was indeed a great session. I'm really thankful to you for conducting okay. this webinar with us today. I'm also thankful to all the participants for their support in making this webinar a huge success. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available on techgig.com very soon. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your time. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.